1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire for good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So that's your memory verse, guys. I hope you've memorized it. And for those that are still to preach, you guys hope you have memorized it. But I'm going to go through these qualifications first and foremost. So the title of the sermon tonight is Bible Qualifications for a Bishop, Part 1. Bible Qualifications for a Bishop, Part 1. Now, the first thing I want you to notice there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop. Hey, what does it mean to desire something? We are talking about it during the break a little bit, about the desire that comes. Now, just uh, if, you, if you don't mind, go to the book of Mark, please. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. You guys turn there. And I'm going to read to you from Luke 20, 46. Luke 20, 46, because you see, we're called, if, if, if it's something that, that uh, you desire, something you want to do, so it's a work you want to take on board, you need to desire that work. But you know, you can desire the wrong things as well, okay? Now, I'm going to read to you from Luke 20, 46. It says, beware of the scribes, okay? The scribes were religious leaders. You know, to be a bishop is to be a religious leader, all right? So these scribes, hey, they had, a, they had a desire to be a scribe, but it says here, beware of the scribes which desire. What do they desire? They desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts. You see, the, the, the uh, scribes here, they had a desire, didn't they? They had a desire to be a religious leader. Hey, but they were desiring the wrong thing. They were desiring self-praise. They were desiring people to look up to them, for them to walk in their long robes, to, to love the greetings of people, to be looked up and, and be lifted up by man. Hey, the reason they had a desire to be a religious leader was because they were seeking the praise of men. Is that what we should be desiring if you have a desire to be a bishop? Of course not. It's not about the praise of men, all right? It's about serving the Lord. It's about serving the people of God. Now, you guys are in Mark 11, verse 22. Let's have a look at uh, a few things you need to be desiring for, okay? Or, or, or how can you work toward being a bishop? How can you work toward aiming for these qualifications? It says here in verse 22, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For very now I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and thou and sorry, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall no doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now look at this, verse twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Hey, so desiring the office of a bishop, it's something if that's what you have, a desire, what does Jesus say you need to do in verse 24? What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Hey, you know what? The desire of a bishop isn't this thing that, you know, uh, you know it, it's sort of um, mystical. You know, when you, when you desire the office of bishop, Jesus says, when you want to desire something, to pray for that. Okay, to believe that you will receive it. Hey, take honest steps. You know, look at this as a real desire, if that's what you have, and, and make it reality. Be praying to God that He would give you uh, that desire of your heart. Okay. Now, I'm just going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 14. You guys go to Philippians chapter 4. You guys go to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. It says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. You know, to become a pastor, to have the office of a bishop, you must desire also spiritual gifts. You know, preaching is a spiritual gift. You know, serving one another, the things that you can bring to the table, the ways you can serve the people, these are spiritual gifts that God gives to every man. It says this, follow after charity. You know, follow after love. Have a love for the brethren and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy. That's 1 Corinthians 14. You guys remember about that church, how bad that church was? But look, this is about the desiring the ability, ability to prophesy. Hey, that's talking about the ability to preach. 
That's something we should be desiring, but as, as well as the spiritual gifts, but also following after charity, making sure that the reason you want these things, the, the, these gifts that you want, the reason you want to prophesy or preach is because first and foremost, you have a love for the work, you have a love for the Lord, you have a love for the brethren. You don't have an unfeigned love. And you know what? As a pastor, and, and we're going to touch upon this some other time, but your wife, your wife is very important. You know, you, your wife must also have a love for the brethren. Your wife must also have a love for the work so she can be there behind the scenes supporting you, being that help meet for you, all right? Now, you guys are in Philippians 4. Look at verse 15. Philippians 4, 15. Now, another, another reason, another thing that we can be desiring to be, a, to be a full-time worker for the Lord, this is Paul speaking to the Philippians. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. He says to the Philippian church, hey, you're the only church that has asked me about, hey, can we give toward the work financially? Okay, you're the only one that asked me this concerning the giving and receiving. Ye only, verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. So when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me my resources. You sent me financial assistance to, to, to meet my needs. Look at verse 17. Not because I desire a gift. The reason you sent me these resources and these financial gift things was not because I desired a gift. Okay? Notice that. What, do you, what should we desire as, as, as bishops? It says, but I desire fruits that may abound to your account. You see, when you have a desire to become a pastor, a full-time worker, it's not about you. You're not desiring gifts for you. You know, you, you don't come for people to, to come and grovel at your feet and come and serve you and, and, and send you financial gifts. And, no, that's not what it's about. Your desire, you know, as, as it was for Paul to the Philippian church, he says, I desire fruit that may abound to your accounts. Hey, I want you, church, to be fruitful. I want you to abound in rewards and riches, okay? And in doing that, yes, one way is for the church to financially support the bishop, but the, the reason for that is that the church may abound in the fruit of the work, okay? So, you know, the, the last thing that I want to mention there is the desire ought to be about making sure the church is fruitful and not desiring personal riches, personal wealth. That's not what it should be about, okay? I mean, if you're looking for a job that will, you know, make you wealthy, then being a pastor, that's not for you, all right? Just go and get a secular job, work hard, and get yourself wealthy that way, okay? And then give to the church, you know, <laughs> give to the church that way. But yeah, becoming a pastor, taking on this office is not about desiring be to become uh, wealthy, okay? Now, what is that person desiring? It said, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. He desireth a good work. Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. You see, being a pastor is a work. It's a job, all right? And it's not just a job. The Bible says it is a good job. It is a good work, okay? God looks down at being the work of a pastor and says, this is good, all right? Now, you know, how much work you put into the church is basically dependent on what your church requires. You know, right now we're a smaller church. You know, I'm not required to do as much work, obviously, as a pastor that might have 100 people, 200 people. All right. Um, so you need to base the amount of work that you do based around what your church requires. And one thing that I'm often asked is, you know, are you a full time pastor? Are you a full-time pastor? I'm often asked that question by different people, and I don't even know how to answer that question, okay? Because I don't, I don't look at being a pastor like having a nine-to-five job. I, I don't look at it like that. I don't look just a nine-to-five, Monday-to-Friday job. I guess that would be considered full-time. Now, am I full-time in that sense that from nine-to-five, Monday-to-Friday, I'm just, you know, running around serving the brethren and running church? No, of course not. I'm not full-time in that regard. You know, but some people consider full time as though, well, you know, you're, the church is fully supporting you financially. You know, the church is supporting you financially and, and that's, how you, hey, that's how you make a living. Well, I'm not full time in that sense either because it's only just recently that I started to, uh, get, you know, to take a bit of an income from the church just recently. So, no, you know, I'm pretty much self-supported, you know, self-supported on, on my previous labor that I have and the investments that I've made. So what does it mean? You know, I don't, I don't think about these terms full time part-time. I just think about what does the church need? God, what do you need me to achieve? What is it that we need to do? 
and I'll work toward that, okay? And, and as you guys know, I'm a real believer of organic growth. You know, I don't need to force ministries. I don't need to force things to happen. I'm sure when, when it's time, when it's time to have a certain ministry, when it's time to do more work, when it's time to do more soul winning, whatever it is, you know, that's the time when the Lord's going to lead me to that and I'll step up and do that work. I don't think about full-time or part-time pastoring. I don't even know what those words mean, to be honest, okay? Now, you guys are in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Now, the reason I want to read this passage is because obviously Paul is writing to Timothy, who's a pastor. And we know the qualifications he gave is, 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 is in 1 Timothy. We're now in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Now look at this. It says here, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, look at this, and prepared unto every good work. Hey, what's the office of a bishop? The Bible said that is a good work. Okay, so what we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is how to prepare yourself for every good work. All right, so we need to backtrack a little bit in that same passage there. Let's go back to verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14, because it said we must purge ourselves. Okay, there are certain things we need to get out of our lives in order to be prepared for this good work. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14 Let's start there. It says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now remember, Timothy is a pastor. Paul is writing to Timothy as a pastor. He says, look, you need to put in remembrance to your people, to your church, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit. Now what does it mean to have no profit? It means it's empty. It's another way of saying vain. Okay, it's another way of saying vain jangling. All right. First Timothy one six says this: from which have, uh, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. One big problem that a church can have is vain jangling. It is to strive about words to no profit, as it's written there in Second Timothy two fourteen. Words of no prof- profit. But then it says that. Keep reading. It says that. But to the subverting of the hearers. Okay, what does subverting mean? That means to overthrow, to utterly ruin. So what Paul is saying here is, in your church, if you have people that are striving, that are arguing, debating about, you know, the terminology, what words to use for this, you know, and and they're just, just wasting time, there's no profit in it, it's going to cause hearers that are hearing that to be overthrown in their faith. You know, to, to give up on the church, to say, hey, this is stupid. Why are we fighting about this? This isn't, you know, and, and leave the church or maybe even, you know, be discouraged in the faith. So that's something that if we want to prepare ourselves for the good work as a pastor, we need to make sure that we're not people that strive about words to no profit. Let's keep reading verse 15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So a pastor should continue in study, okay? Notice, remember, Timothy is already a pastor. What does Paul say to him? Study, Timothy. Study to show thyself approved. So you see, it's not about just studying to become a pastor, but once you are a pastor, you need to continue studying the Word of God. You can't get to a point where you're like, man, I, I know the doctrines now, and you know we're just going to take it easy. I'm, just, I'm not going to prepare much because I know it all. No, you keep studying. You keep learning. It's, it's a really bad place when a pastor thinks he, they can't learn anymore. And you know what? I, to, to some extent, I feel like there's probably not a lot more I can learn as far as major doctrines. Like, all that's pretty much cemented in place. I mean, it should be by the time you get to a pastor at church, okay? But there are the little things, right? There's always, we always have conversations about some verse, some passage. What do you think that means? It's this parable. You know, there's always these little things that we need to, you know, that we can continue learning on, but make sure that it's building upon the foundational things that you've already learned. And you're not starting to create some, some crazy new doctrines based on it. But, you know, to study to show the self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Okay? So, a pastor should not be someone that is ashamed, okay? A pastor that has not studied. You know, when, when they preach, there ought to be some obvious um, effort that's been put behind it, okay? If you come to, to, hear, to hear preaching and just hearing the same thing over and over again, you, guy, you know this guy's not preparing. You know this guy's not putting any work toward it, okay? And it's a shame to that person. It's a shame to that person. You know, when you come to church, you ought to be hearing new things, 
You know, learning new parts of the Bible. You know, discovering new things that are being taught. And, and you know, you ought to know that your pastor is putting in his study, you know. And, uh, and then it says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, of course, our dispensational brothers... You know, would, would look at this, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth and say, well, that means that's dispensationalism, brother. That's working out the seven dispensations and, and teaching the dis- dispensational theology. No, no, no. It says rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, to divide is, is another way of saying to distribute the word of truth. So you go and study. Okay. You go and study as a pastor. And now you take the word of truth and you divide that. Okay. So instead of me just preaching the whole Bible, like just bang, you know, no, I've got to rightly divide. I've got to take p- passages. You know, that's why, we, you know, we, we look at topical sermons. You know, you look at certain topics, you divide it to that topic, you teach on that topic, or you look at chapters, you divide that chapter, you, you teach that chapter. Hey, when you preach uh, bits and pieces of the Bible, hopefully eventually the whole Bible, but you, you've got to take the Bible as a whole and break it down, divide it and teach it that way. Okay, let's keep reading verse uh, 16. But, sh- but shun profane and va- vain babblings. It's the same kind of thing about the, the words to no profit, the profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So, you know, if, if our church, we start arguing about ridiculous things, vain talking, the Bible says here it will increase to more ungodliness. Okay, it's not just going to end. You actually have to put a stop to it and say, hey, we're not having that discussion anymore. All right. I mean, you know, someone brings up the flat earth, you know, and you guys start vain, you know, start talking about this and it becomes, no, there comes a time when you say, look, brothers, I I wish you stopped by now, but you just have to stop now. Okay. This is causing problems. This is upsetting people. This is stupid. Why are you teaching this ridiculous stuff? You know, you've got to put an end to these things. You need to uh, 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 purge these things out. Okay. Uh, It says, uh, and then it says verse 17, for their word will eat doff as a canker of whom is Hymenius and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You see, the flesh, here's the thing about the Bible, guys. I'm sure we all, all of us, we've read the Bible, we, we know it. I'm sure we all have some quirky doctrine. I'm sure all of us have some, you know, fringe, quirky doctrine that we've read in the Bible. We, we, we think, yeah, that, that's, that seems true. I think I've worked something out. You know, but you know that nobody else believes it. You know that nobody else sees it the way you do. It's some quirky thing you've got there, right? And the flesh, this is what the flesh is going to do. When you have that doctrine, the flesh is going to be like, I need to tell my brethren, you know, because the flesh wants to be seen as wise. Look, look at this thing that I found. I think this is awesome. Okay. But when you teach it, it's going to cause division. When you teach it, when you start talking about it, people are going to be rubbed the wrong way. They're going to get upset, frustrated. Why are you believing this? No one believes this guy, like your brother. You know, whatever it is, well, what, that, that, that vain uh, babbling, you, the, you need to make sure you purge that out of your system. You know, even if you have some weird thing that you believe and you become, look, I'm sure I have things here that I, that I, I think, you know, but I'm not going to preach it, all right? Because I can't be dogmatic enough about it, you know, I understand if I preach it, people are going to be wondering, how did how you come to that conclusion? And I'm like, well, so when, when you find things that are weird, you know, and you think that's what the Bible says, but you, may, you know, best thing to do is just put it in the back of your mind, okay, put it on the back burner, and maybe eventually at some time in the future, the Lord will reveal that to you, okay, will reveal the truth about that and, and, and clarify that, okay, but the flesh loves to show how wise it is, okay, and, uh, and that will, uh, cause, uh, the vain babblings. The, the, so the Bible says there in verse 16, shun profane and va- vain babbling. Shun it. Stop it. Get rid of it. Okay? Don't, don't go there. Cause it'll cause conflict within the church. And then verse 19, you know, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. How else can you prepare yourself for this good work, guys? Is to depart from iniquity. You know, you can't, as a pastor, you know, desiring the office of pastor, say, well, my life's pretty clean. My life's pretty good. There are people that are, that are worse sinners than me. Yes, I still have my sins, but, you know, I'm quite happy with where I am. No, we need to continue, you know, uh, overcoming the sins in our lives. We need to continue overcoming iniquity. Never get to a point where you're comfortable with where you're at. Never get to a point where I'm pretty good. I've just got these sins. I'm sure God will allow me to keep those sins, you know, because the rest of me is good. No, no, no. We need to continue overcoming those iniquities, okay? We need to shun. We need to get rid of that. We need to purge ourselves of these things. So, 
if you want, if you have a desire for the good work, guys, and you need to prepare yourself for the good work, these are the things that you need to overcome. Okay? The, the vain talk and the vain babblings, the things that have no profit, get rid of it. Okay? If, if it's in, if it's in the, you know, if you're causing that to, to develop in the church, you know, get rid of it. Number two, study. You know, know the Bible, prepare, divide the Word of God so people can hear it, people can understand it, break down sermons so they can uh, rightly divide it and, and uh, be able to take it in smaller portions. And of course, overcome the sins that we all have in our lives. We need to keep working to overcome those sins. Never get comfortable with the sins in your life. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about now, um, if you look, at, if you remember our memory verse, what comes after um, desiring the good work? A bishop then must be blameless. Okay, blameless. Go to Philippians chapter two, please. Philippians chapter two. Very quickly, what does it mean to be blameless? Obviously, it doesn't mean to be sinless. Okay, because none of us are sinless. Okay, and all of us have some sin in our lives, and we can all be blamed for that sin. Okay, we can't blame anyone, one else. We blame ourselves for that sin. Of course, it doesn't mean sinless, but what blameless basically means is that, is that this person is with no major sin, no major fault in their life. Where someone can look at that person and go, man, you've got this big problem in your life. You know, if someone can look at your life and say, man, you've got a major issue here, you're not blameless. Okay, like if, if, your, if your family's falling apart, you know, there's friction in your marriage and it's obvious. That's not being blameless. That's something that's very obvious in your life that's a major problem, you know. But we all have, we all have sins in our life. We all have those things. But just, you know, we've got to make sure that it's not some major sin or some major fault in our lives. But look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. It tells us how to be blameless. It says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So hey, what's the first thing there in verse 14? How do we be blameless? Okay, first thing, we need to make sure that everything we do is without murmurings and disputings. Okay, we can't be whiners, you know, whingers. You know, I didn't get my chance to preach. This other guy got his chance to preach, but I didn't get my chance. You know, well, pastors asked me to do this work in the church. I don't want to do that. Why isn't he asking someone else? Hey, that's someone that does things with murmurings and disputings. Okay? <clears throat> you know, don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer. Don't be someone that finds fault in everything. You know, sometimes you can work really hard, have a great church, and, and, and you know, things are going well. And there are still people that are going to be in the church and, and you, you know these, you, you know these people a mile away, that all they focus on are the bad things. All they focus on is complaining about certain people in the church. All they focus on is, well, why aren't we singing these hymns? Or why, why, why do we do ministry like this? And it's like, instead of focusing on the positive things, they'd rather look at the, the things that they feel are out of line and, and complain and murmur about those things. Hey, you know what? I want to encourage you guys to be a people that if there's something that's not quite right in the church that you let me know about it you know you let me know say hey this is something and this is what i'm willing to do to make it better okay you know when you have something that you're concerned about you know don't just complain about it come with a solution you know be someone that's blameless okay it's good to point things out but come with a solution be willing to make a change yourself instead of requiring other people to do it for you all right so um it also said there in verse 15 Blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Without rebuke. This means someone with a good reputation. Okay? Someone that is blameless is someone that has a good reputation. Okay? Might be a good reputation in the church. But we also know that it means a good reputation outside of the church. Okay? Of good reputation. What else does it say there? Um, in, the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Hey, you ought to be someone that shines in this world. When people look at you in this world, in this crooked uh, uh, generation, in this crooked nation, perverse nation, they see and they say, this person's different. Why is he different? And hopefully, you give them the answer because you're a child of God. You know, you're, you're a child of God and you're blameless. And then it said there in verse, um, uh, verse 16, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. You know, does your life give joy to other Christians. You know, when, you, when, you, when I see a godly man, when I see, when I saw brother um, Tim and, uh, and, and David soul winning today, 
you know what? I rejoiced. I was so thankful that, you know what? It's, it's a windy day. I'm sure you guys are tired, especially you, you know, traveling from Sydney, but are still willing to go out and do the works of God. You know, are you someone that, that people can look at your life and say, hey, I can rejoice in this person because I can see the love and service that they have toward the God, toward God. This is what it means to be blameless. All right. To shine as lights in the world, being a, a good example of a godly man. You know what? The pastor should be a good example. Should be, okay? Should be a good example. But if you have a desire for the office, you know you need to meet these qualifications, you should also be working toward being someone that people in the church say, hey, this is a godly man. Hey, he has a godly wife. You know, this is a godly family. You know, I, I wish I could be a little bit like this. You know, I can wish I can work toward and, 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 be, and be godly like this family. What's the next thing? It says husband of one wife. The husband of one wife, meaning that if you are going to be a pastor, have that office, you must be married. Okay? You must be married. You must have been married once and that you're still married to the same woman. Okay? It's not married to one woman at a time. Okay? It's not having many divorces and many remarriages as long as it's one woman at a time. No. It's the husband of one wife. And you know what? I would also say that you cannot be some, you cannot be a pastor if you've been divorced or remarried. Okay, and some people say, well, what about if it's before they were saved? Before they were saved, they made the mistake. They got they got divorced and they got remarried. It's the qualifications are there for a reason. It's not about this is the point you get saved. I mean, I, I hear people say, but that was under the blood. It's like, but all our sins are under the blood. I mean, all our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins are under the blood. You know, it's not under the blood just because you're ignorant and now it's not under the blood. It's like, of course it's all under the blood. Jesus Christ paid for all sins, okay? But here's the thing. It's not just about, you might say, but, you know, he, he is husband of one wife. You know, he's been divorced, you know, or, or, married, or maybe he married a divorced woman. Maybe he's never been married, but he married a divorced woman. Doesn't that fit under the category, category of, of being the husband of one wife? I suppose it kind of does, but now you're no longer blameless. Because there's this major sin, a major sin of adultery that occurred, and it's, that sticks out. You know, you would be someone that would be not qualified, unqualified, disqualified from being a pastor. You know, and, and the question that comes up is, you know, what about a, a man whose wife has passed away? So, you know, you've been pastoring, you, you are the husband of one wife, and your wife passes away. You know, are you, do you require, would you expect that person to step down? Well, I'll give you my answer. The Bible doesn't really tell us, you know, this level of detail. Obviously, it's going to come down to the, the needs of the church to some extent, okay, and what the church, how, how the church operates and the needs of the church. But I want to give you my thoughts on this very quickly. So let, let's say hypothetically my wife passes away, Christina passes away, okay? Now, you know, we have the funeral service on a Saturday, and then I come in on Sunday, you know, and you guys have your arms crossed. It's like you can't be pastor anymore because your wife, you know, you're no longer the husband of one wife. Obviously, that would be ridiculous, okay? Obviously, that would be ridiculous, okay? But I do believe that it is, it is the right thing for a pastor to get remarried as soon as possible, okay? I'm not saying to rush into it. Obviously, you've got to find a godly woman, a woman that you can love, a woman that would be willing to, to look after your children, you know, and, and, and um, you know, has, you know, some level of those qualifications, or has those qualifications that a wife requires, you know, of a, of a, of a pastor, but I think it's super important because, you know, you're teaching the Word of God. You're teaching about family. You're teaching about, you know, um, um, being, a, being a father, being a parent, and, and being a godly husband. You've got to, people have got to be able to see that you're actually doing that in your life. Not that you just once did it, but you're still doing it. You're still working uh, toward having a godly uh, uh, marriage and things like that. So I do believe it's very important, not just that, but also the temptation that will come, you know, naturally you know, being without your wife and, and you know, better to, to, to get a new wife, you know, otherwise you might be tempted to sin, you know, tempted to commit uh, fornication. And if you did that, obviously that person will be disqualified uh, from being a pastor as well. So I do believe that, uh, that if, if your wife passes away, you should seek as soon as you can to uh, find another, another wife. And um, it's about protecting the integrity of the office of a bishop. You know, I don't believe a pastor should be going five years with a deceased wife and still pastoring. I think that's, that's, that's too much. That's my, you know, that's my opinion. I don't think that, that should be the case, okay? Now, here's the thing. If, if, I've been, if I've been pastoring, let's say my wife passed away, hypothetically, and I'm pastoring for a year, and um, I still haven't found another wife, by, by this stage, I'm probably thinking, I should be thinking, which man in this church 
can, can step up to the office. Okay? I haven't been disqualified from the office. You know, I can still ordain a man, but you know, I probably shouldn't be operating in that office at this point in time. You know? And if there's no one in the church, does that mean I should just go five years, ten years like this? No, of course not. You know, if, 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 if we went a long time, there's nobody in the church that could step up and be the pastor, you know, I would just, I would just say, guys, look, I'm stepping down from, from um, you know, what's the word? I'm stepping down from the operations of, of this office at this point in time. And I'm stepping down. I can still preach. You know, I'd like to get different men that can rotate and, and we can all preach and do things. But for now, until I find a wife, until I can get this uh, part of my life organized, then later on after that, I might be able to step back up and become a pastor. But I think at that stage, you know, if there's nobody in the church, you should really probably step down and not be a pastor anymore because you're damaging the integrity of that office, you know. Uh, now, if you guys can just quickly go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 21. Exodus chapter 2, verse 21. So I just want to show you this about Moses. So obviously Moses... Is a, is a picture of an Old Testament pastor. Exodus chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And Moses was content to, to dwell with a man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. So we see here in, in Exodus 2, 21, Moses was about, um, uh, how old was he here? He would have been about 40 years old. He would have been about 40 years old when he married Zipporah. Okay? Um, and then uh, it says, verse 22, And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now go to Numbers 12, please. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. So what we're about to read now is about 40 years later. Okay, Because if you guys know the story, that it's 40 years later when, G when God calls um, Moses to take the people out of the land of Israel. Uh, sorry, out of the land of Egypt. And um, it says here in Numbers 12, verse 1. It says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Okay? So we see here in Numbers 12, 1, Moses gets remarried. Okay? Moses gets remarried. Now, we don't know what happened to Zipporah. The Bible doesn't tell us. But this is at least 40 years later. I think it's safe to assume, okay, that Zipporah had passed away. Okay, so it's safe to assume that Zipporah had passed away, and what does Moses do? If he's an example of an Old Testament pastor, what does he do? He finds another uh, woman and gets married to this woman, this time an Ethiopian woman. So I just want to show you this example that we can take from Moses. You know, before he went into Israel, he was married. Okay, that's one of the requirements of being a pastor. But after he lost his first wife, what did he do? Did he continue just leading without a wife? No. He got remarried and married now an Ethiopian woman. So, you know, if, if Christina were to pass away, for example, you know, I would look to remarry, you know, for the personal companionship, to find a mother for my children, but also to maintain the integrity of the office of a bishop. And if it were an extended time where I would not be able to find a wife, you know, I would, like I said, I would step down from operating in the office of a bishop. Um, I would still hold the office, but I would be looking at somebody else that I could ordain and, and take on that mantle. You know, and then let's say another example. Maybe someone's very elderly. Maybe they're in their 70s, you know, and 80s, and they lose their wife, and they're a pastor. My personal opinion is, if, if you haven't got uh, someone, but by, 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 if you're that age and you haven't got someone that can take over the church, I think you've done a bad job, okay, as a pastor. I think you should always be looking at someone that can eventually take over for you. But I would say at that point, you're unlikely going to get remarried. I think the wisest thing to do at that age is to just step down and say, look, I no longer meet the qualifications of being a bishop okay let's keep going the next requirements was to be vig vigilant and sober vigilant and sober and if you guys can go to first peter chapter 5 please first peter chapter 5 first peter chapter 5 now i want to keep these two words together being vigilant and sober and because if you go to first peter chapter 5 verse 8 you'll notice this it says be sober be vigilant say why these two words are together, just like they were in the qualifications of a bishop. It says, Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You see, guys, these are qualifications that are required of a pastor because Satan does look to devour the church of God. Satan is looking to devour the people of God. 
All right? You need to be vigilant. You need to be watching. You need to be sober-minded. You need to be aware of the dangers that might come to the church. This is why it's called the office of a bishop. A bishop is an overseer. You know, this is where the word pastor also is very similar. Being a shepherd, you're watching over the sheep. Now, look, if someone walks into the church and I think they're a potential threat, you know, am I just going to kick that person out of the church? No. You know, I'm not just going to kick someone that I think is a potential threat because I don't know. Okay, they might not be. Okay, but I'm not necessarily going to trust that person. Okay, if I think someone's a potential threat, I'm not going to put them in a position where they can have, you know, authority or, or influence in the church. Okay, if I think they're a threat, you know, but at the same time, I'm not just going to kick someone out because I feel, oh, that could hurt our church. No, that, that's not how things ought to be. You know, people are found, um, would, uh, uh, are innocent, uh, before they're found guilty. You've got to, you know, you can't just say someone's guilty. And then tell them, hey, tell me why you're innocent. No, they're first innocent until they're proven uh, guilty. So being vigilant, being aware. And one thing that I'd be looking at to know that you're a vigilant person, that I know you're going to be vigilant, uh, vigilant for your church, is are you vigilant for your family? You know, does your family, is your family influenced by the world? You know, do, you know is, your, is your family watching all the, the worldly movies? You know, do, do your children know all the worldly lyrics of, of worldly songs? You know, are, are you being vigilant for your children? Are you being protective of your children, of the influences that comes from the world? And if you can't be vigilant for your own family, the people that you ought to love the most, then you're definitely not going to be vigilant for your church. Okay? You're definitely not going to try to protect your church. So I think that's, that's very important. That's something I'd be looking at, is to see what influence the, does the world have on your family. Now, here's the thing. There's always going to be some influence, okay? You, you can't put all your family into a protective bubble and, and not be aware of the world. Of course, that's not the case, okay? But, you know, if, if, they're, if your family, especially your children, if they're just like the world, you know, you haven't been vigilant. You haven't been protective of your family. You know, what's to say you're going to be vigilant for the church that God may give you? You know, I, w- I wouldn't ordain someone that um, is not vigilant. The next one is sober, you know, being sober. You know, usually we think of so- sobriety as not being drunk. But also a drug user. I, I, I would not ordain someone that is on antidepressant drugs or antipsychotic drugs, okay? Because they're not sober. They're not sober-minded. It's like they need the drugs just to, just to get by life. Hey, that's not, that's not how a pastor should be. A pastor shouldn't be taking these kinds of hard drugs that affect the brain. So I'll just leave it there for sober. Let's keep going. Of good behavior. Can you guys please turn to Hebrews 13, please? Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Of good behavior. Now, the word behavior isn't found that, that often in your Bibles. You're going to find the word conversation more often. You know, conversation. Quite often when the Bible uses the word conversation, it's not conversation like we think of it, like just speaking to one another. No, it's, it's about your behavior. Okay, it's about how you show your life. And I'll just quickly read to you in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. So it's the same book that we find this of good behavior. It says, you know, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, that's behavior, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You see, the pastor needs to be an example of good behavior. If you want to be a pastor, you want to take on this office, you must show that you're someone of good behavior. You're someone of good conversation. Now, you guys are in Hebrews 13. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. It says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. Now, remember conversation. That's your behavior, right? Your behavior ought to be without covetousness. You shouldn't be desiring the things that don't belong to you. You shouldn't be someone that's greedy, you know, and, and unsatisfied for the, with the things that God has given you. It says, look, and be content with such things as ye have. For he have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God wants you to be content with the lot in life that he's given you. And why? Because he just says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hey, I'm with you in what you have. I've given you these things, you know, and, and, and you can taint your behavior. You can, get, you can get into bad behavior with the sin of covetousness. Okay, the sin of covetousness. In fact, the sin of covetousness will get you kicked out of the church. Okay? Now, let's uh, backtrack a little bit here because let's go back to verse number one. Let's go back to verse number one and let's understand what our conversation ought to be like. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. It says here, let brotherly love continue. What ought your good behavior be like? That you have brotherly love for one another. You love the brethren. 
You say, but I don't get along with this person. That's okay. You don't need to get along with people, but do you love them? Like if that person was in need, would you, you, know, would you go and, and help that brother? Will you go and, 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 and try to fulfill the needs that that brother has? You don't have to get along with everybody in the church. Okay? But you do. You are commanded to love the brethren. All right? That's a good example of, um, of good behavior. You know, when, when a brother or sister is backslidden, when they're cast down, they're depressed, you know, do you just talk about them? Oh, did you know sister so-and-so was, was, was upset you know, this Sunday? Or was brother, you know, brother, brother so-and-so didn't even say hello to me? You know, is that how you respond? Or do you have a love for that brother and you go and encourage them and, and lift them up instead of speaking bad of them? Verse number two, it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained uh, angels unawares. Hey, so are you someone when there's visitors, when there's strangers coming into the church, you know, do you go in and greet them? Do you go and entertain them, you know? Are you someone that's really encouraged when you see visitors and you want them to feel welcomed? Is that you? You know, are you doing that? That's good behavior, you know? And it's not just about greeting the visitor. It says enter- entertain strangers. Now, I'm not saying put on a show, you know, go juggling and, and show them your, your soccer skills and that's how you entertain them. I'm not, I, it's not, that's not what it's about. But, you know, to entertain someone means basically that, you know, you spend time with that person. You get to know that person. You know, you make them feel welcome. You make them feel valued in the church. It's not just visitor A has turned up. I said hello to visitor A. I've done my bit. Now I'm going away. I'm going to go to my, my clique of friends. You know, I'm going to go and go, no, no. You go and entertain that person. You go and make them feel welcome and, um, you know, part of the church. That's part of being of good behavior. Verse number three, it says, Rem- remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer advers- um, adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So believers who are incarcerated, believers who are in prison, you know, now, I don't, I don't, the only one that I knew of was Pastor Logan Robinson, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I would try to contact him, say, hey, we're praying for you, brother. Is there anything you need? You know, I, I, I phoned him up and tried to encourage him, things like that, because I was aware of this passage, you know, that, that our brethren that are incarcerated, that are, that are in bonds, we need to be thinking about that person. We need to be remembering them. You know, it says there, as, you, as being yourselves also in the body. It's like you need to be thinking about them as though you are the one that's that's um that's bound that you're the one that's incarcerated you know keep them in prayer that's good behavior verse number four it says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers god will judge you know so your wife should be your one and only partner in life you know if you go chasing after some other woman obviously that's bad behavior obviously that's covetousness you know and and if you you're someone that commits adultery you're immediately disqualified from being a pastor you know, immediately disqualified from being a pastor. So if we're trying to work toward having good behavior, then Hebrews chapter 13 is a good one to turn to, to make sure that you're working toward these things. And um, if you guys can go to uh, verse number six now, just drop down to verse six. It says, uh, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you. That's talking about the pastor who have spoken unto you the word of God, that's the job of the pastor, right? To speak the word of God, whose faith follow, 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 considering the end of their conversation. You see, a pastor needs to have good behavior. Why? Why? It's because others are looking at your life and others should be going, hey, you know what? I, I love how pastor is so friendly. I love how pastor welcomes the visitors. I love how pastor feeds us the word of God. You know, and, and I, I love how, you know, his relationship with his wife. I love to see that it's strong. I love to see the children. They seem to love the Lord and, and love church. And, uh, you know, if, if you can see those things, if you can have that good behavior, not to puff uh, the, the one that has the rule of you up, but to encourage the believers, to set a good example so other people can go, yeah, you know what? It's doable to live a godly life. It's doable. And I'd like to follow after the Lord and, and live after his commands. That's why it's so important to be someone of good behavior. If you have a pastor and you're like, you know what? This guy has bad behavior. You know, I wouldn't want to be like that. Then you need to get away from that person, okay? Because that person's not living up to the qualification that's required of them, you know? The next one is given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. So obviously that means to be hospitable, you know, and to be hospitable means to receive guests and strangers. Now, I've already covered this a little bit, but of course, if you have guests or strangers, people that turn up to church, 
we ought to make them feel welcome. Yes, you know, into your house, you know, pastors should invite people into their house. Yes, but I think the house of God is a priority. Making sure that people are invited to the house of God, that people are made, work, made, made to feel welcomed here. And uh, that's, that's a key thing to being hospitable. I'm going to read to you quickly from Romans 12, verse 13. It says, Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Let me read that again. Distributing to the, 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 to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. That's Romans 12, 13. And so if we keep that within the context, what does it mean to be hospitable there? It means when the saints have necessities that you're willing to distribute. You're willing to go and help the brethren when they're in need. Okay, you know, if, if a brother's, uh, someone's in hospital, okay, you know, we should pay them a visit, encourage them, ask them, what can we pray about? You know, someone's in need, whatever that is, what can I do to help you? That's being hospitable. You know, today we have this mindset that being hospitable is about having someone over for a meal. And that is, hosp- that is hospitality. That's part of it. But it's beyond that. Okay, it's beyond that. It's making sure that you truly have uh, a care for the needs of the brethren and that you're able to fulfill those needs when they come up and then lastly apt to teach apt to teach now apt means aptitude you know which is a natural ability a natural ability to teach you know to be able to break down the bible into portion sized meals to feed god's people you know are you apt to teach you know the lord said here sorry i'll just read to you in exodus 4 11 you guys turn to uh where can i get you you guys go to acts 20 please go to acts 20. i'm going to read to you from exodus 4 verse 11 it says, and this is the first time, by the way, it says uh, the, the, the word teach, okay? It says here, uh, this is God speaking to uh, Moses. It says, and the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seen, or the blind, have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, look at this, and teach thee what thou shalt, what thou shalt say. Okay, and teach thee what thou shalt say. You see, what is the job of the preacher? What is the job of the pastor? To teach what God had said. Okay, to teach what God had said. That's why when we open the word of God, it's not about my wisdom. I'm not here to entertain you with my stories or my jokes. Okay, now they might be part of it. Okay, but it's, you know, your teaching is not based on your experiences. The teaching should not be based on your jokes. The teaching should be based on what God had said. Okay, that's being apt to teach, being able to teach the word of God. Hey, any of us can teach anything, but we need to be people that can teach the word of God and make sure that the things that you add is just helping clarify, helping understand what the word of God already says. And of course, there's Matthew 5.19, which says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You know what? There's one way to be great, there's, there's, out of many ways to be great in the kingdom of heaven, is to do and teach the commandments of God. And what a great honor, you know, to, to, to be a pastor. You know, if, if you get the opportunity to preach, think of it as a great honor to teach the commandments of God. But you should do them and teach them and you'll be counted great in the kingdom of God. Okay, it's so important that we teach the commandments of God. You guys are in Acts 20. Look at Acts 20 verse 27. Acts 20 verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What should we teach, guys? All the counsel of God, all of it's valuable, okay? We, we shouldn't be people that just skip passages and go, well, I can't teach that. No, you ought to be someone that is apt to teach all the counsel of God. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God. What are you feeding them? The whole counsel of God, right? Which he have purchased with his own blood, okay? So you need to be someone that is ready to teach it all. If you're afraid to teach against the homosexuals, if you're afraid to teach certain portions of the Bible, you're afraid to say to someone, they're going to hell without Christ, then you're not apt to teach. You're not apt to teach. You might be a natural speaker. You might be a great presenter of things. But if you're not able to just, you know, without compromise, teach the Word of God, you're not apt to teach the Word of God. Okay? Now, I do believe the word apt, aptitude is a natural ability, but I do believe it is an ability you can learn and acquire. 
I mean, all these things, all these qualifications are things that somebody is not, has not achieved. So they've got to work toward achieving that. Okay, you might be a single person. Well, before I become a pastor, I need to work toward finding a wife. So you work toward finding that wife, getting married, work toward having a faithful family, all these kinds of things. Well, someone that struggles to stand before the public and teach, you know, you just need to work on those things. You can, you can learn these things. You know, just be, you might say today, I'm, I'm too shy. I can't do it. Okay, you might not be apt to teach right now, but start developing the skills. Okay, start developing. You know, there are, ask God for the gift of preaching. Ask God for the gift of prophecy. That you can, you can learn it and, and, and not have the fear to preach the word of God. So, you know, this is something we all need to be working toward. I, I'm trying to work toward it. I'm trying to find better breathing techniques. I'm looking it up on YouTube, how I can breathe better so I can project my voice louder. You know, that I can breathe through my, um, what do they call this part of the body? But yeah, you know, you know, preach from your diaphragm so it doesn't wear out your throat. Because sometimes I'm preaching on Tuesday night in Sydney. I come and preach on Wednesday night. I'm feeling so tired. I feel like my throat's like burning and I can't do it, you know, especially because I'm song leading as well. So I'm trying to, t- trying to learn how can, I, how can I project my voice and not damage uh, my throat. But these are things that we can, we can definitely be working toward. So that's what I've got for you guys today. I hope that was beneficial. I do want to break down all these qualifications and go into more detail, like I said, and uh, we'll be continuing, I'll continue to do this next month as well. Let's pray.